The 18th century began in France during the absolute monarchy of Louis XIV, the Sun King, and it would end in a revolution and a republic. The events leading up to this extraordinary turnaround would converge during the last quarter of the century. And yet the reign of Louis XVI had started out under promising circumstances. Nicknamed Louis the Desired, the young king was very popular. He was honest and full of good intentions. Little did he know, however, that a few years later, people would be calling him Louis the Last. He married the Austrian princess Marie Antoinette to seal an alliance with the Holy Roman Empire. The people of Paris welcomed his young wife with fervor and adoration. She was cheered by the crowds, and someone whispered in her ear, Madame, you have here a hundred thousand lovers. But the honeymoon did not last. Disenchantment with the queen would grow over the next 13 years. In the year 1787, aware of her abysmal unpopularity, Marie Antoinette never left Versailles. In the pamphlets denouncing her alleged life of debauchery, she was being called the Austrian bitch. The queen urgently needed to change her image. That summer, as part of the Royal Academy of Painting Salon at the Palais du Louvre, the latest work by the queen's official portraitist, Louise Elizabeth Viget, married name Le Brun, was presented to the public and the press. It was entitled Marie Antoinette de Lorraine Habsburg, Queen of France and her children. The queen was accused of being a bad wife and a bad mother. The painting royally contradicted her detractors. What do we see? Marie Antoinette, wearing a heavy red velvet dress trimmed with sable, literally towers over the viewer with a steady gaze and a majestic smile on her lips. She is holding her youngest son, Louis Charles, the Duke of Normandy, in her lap. Clinging to her arm, her daughter, Marie-Thérèse Charlotte, known as Madame Royale, gazes up at her ecstatically. The heir to the throne stands slightly off to the side, as befits a future king. The golden light which falls from an angle, as prescribed by the rules, illuminates them with the aura of their elevated rank. The children are clamoring, we are the descendants of the king, we are beautiful, hale and hearty, this is our august mother. What truths lie behind this excruciatingly perfect image? In order to find out, we will have to examine the different elements and figures that are portrayed in it, decode the forms and the colors, hunt for clues hidden in the canvas, and unravel the story of a work of propaganda. When the Royal Academy's exhibition first opened its doors, the space that was reserved for Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun's painting in the Grand Salon of the Palais du Louvre featured a desperately empty frame. I was told by the director that the painting wasn't done yet. Other more truthful painters assured me that it was perfectly finished, but they don't dare exhibit it during the first few days for fear of the abuse that might result from an unbridled mob. In front of the blank frame, one visitor quipped, Behold the deficit! The joke hit home and continued to circulate during the Salon even after the long-awaited painting had appeared. It was true that the royal finances were in a particularly disastrous state following the Seven Years' War, in which France had fought against Great Britain and lost many of its colonies. Louis XVI's subsequent decision to back the revolutionaries in the American War of Independence against the British Crown only worsened the situation. The monarchy had recklessly indebted the country, which was on the verge of bankruptcy. Half of its budget now went into paying the interest on the national debt. 
in the spring, Louis XVI convened the Assembly of Notables in order to propose a radical new fiscal reform. The notables rejected the king's plan and demanded the convocation of the Estates General, which consisted of the nobility, the clergy, and the third estate. The king refused, and so the problem remained unsolved, giving free rein to the libel and defamation campaigns that criticized the expenditures of the court, and in particular, the queen's extravagant wardrobe and her excessive taste for gambling. And in fact, the Queen did love to gamble. Five years earlier, Marie Antoinette had set up tables in the Salon of Peace at Versailles, adjacent to her apartments, where she was fond of playing a high-stakes card game called Pharaoh. The King had tried to restrict these gambling parties to one night a week, in vain. Her losses were so high that she confided in the Austrian ambassador so that he might cover her debts. Her brother, Joseph II, Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire of Austria, traveled incognito to Versailles. He found the court transformed into a gambling den and tried to reason with his sister, whom he willingly described as having her head in the wind. The painting by Elisabeth Vigée Lebrun depicts the queen in that very same room, the Salon of Peace, devoid of any games or any kind of frivolity. Opening onto the Hall of Mirrors, the setting symbolizes her marriage to the King of France, a political and military alliance with Austria that was advantageous for the kingdom. Behind Marie Antoinette, there is a column, an essential element in royal portraiture, which establishes her stature. The artist plays with the complementarity between the reds, the greens, and the ochres, colors that are also found in the arabesques in the cushion and the carpet. The red of her dress is a sovereign color. It is linked symbolically to the discreet fleur-de-lis ornamentation on the cabinet and to the crown sitting in the shadows. Paradoxically enough, these symbols seem to have escaped the eyes of the exhibition's commentators. They praise the soft brush strokes, the naturalness of the traits, the beautiful colors, and the artfulness of the drapery, but were impervious to the grandeur of the portrait. Although it cannot be denied that there are elements of great beauty, that everything is painted to perfection, these aspects of grace, life, and truth found in Madame Le Brun's easel paintings are weakened when applied to a subject as big as this. Elisabeth Vigée Le Brun had already painted approximately 30 portraits of Marie Antoinette. They depicted a queen deliberately breaking with tradition, portraying her as a model and arbiter of feminine elegance. Before she encountered the flattering and tender gaze of Madame Le Brun, Marie Antoinette had detested painters. She wrote to her mother in Austria, The painters kill me and make me despair. I delayed the post so as to allow my portrait to be finished. It has just been brought to me. It resembles me so little that I cannot send it. I hope to have a good one next month. The Queen appreciated the way the skillful hand of Elisabeth Vigée Le Brun arranged her face. She had previously found herself unattractive. Now she was beautiful. No other official portraitist had ever accomplished that feat. Marie Antoinette naively confessed that painting had never held any appeal for her, that the only merit she saw in a portrait was resemblance. Yet she was able to sense long before anyone else Elisabeth Vigée Le Brun's ability to express a certain benevolence that would revolutionize the art of portrait painting. The daughter of a modest pastel painter, Elizabeth showed artistic talent at an early age. When she was 11 years old, she would go into her father's studio when he was out and use the pastels that had fallen on the floor to draw for hours on scraps of paper. Her father's friendships gave her opportunities that were inaccessible to women. As a teenager, she received lessons from the history painter Doyen, as well as from Joseph Vernet, who encouraged her to study the Flemish and Italian artists. At 15, she had already painted her first masterpiece, 
a portrait of her mother. All over Paris, the young girl became the talk of the town. Soon the ladies of the court began coming to her. Then her name reached the ears of the queen. Elizabeth was requested to make herself available for a portrait of Marie Antoinette. A relationship of trust was soon established between the two women who were of the same age. They got along well, and they both shared the same love of music. After the sittings, they would sometimes sing duets by the composer Greatree, with the queen accompanying them on her dear harp. Marie Antoinette appointed Elizabeth as her official painter, without waiting for the artist to be elected to the Royal Academy, a domain from which women were all but excluded, and which the queen would help her enter a few years later. The queen had trouble concentrating, and the artist knew she had to work quickly. One should try to do the head, and especially the face, in three or four sittings of an hour and a half each, two hours at the most. Otherwise, the model tends to grow bored and impatient. For this painting, Elisabeth Vigée Lebrun chose her subject's garments very carefully. The queen is attired in exactly the same dress worn by her mother-in-law in a portrait 30 years earlier. The previous queen had been a simple and very religious woman who had been well liked by the people. Such a reference was thus a clever way of playing down Marie Antoinette's extravagant clothing habits. This type of dress, in the so-called French style, had been worn since the 1720s. It was fairly common, varying only in terms of the fabric and the designs. The queen is also wearing a velvet cap adorned with ostrich feathers. The artist wanted to show a lock of hair escaping from underneath, but Marie Antoinette refused. She had not forgotten the letter from her imperial mother, who had expressed displeasure upon seeing one of her portraits. It is not the image of a queen of France, but of an actress. A pretty young queen with many charms of her own has no need of such follies. The airy gowns worn in these portraits provoked a storm of criticism, and the queen's favorite artist was disparaged and maligned by her male colleagues, who perfidiously denounced her lack of academic training. As it was, Elisabeth Vigée Lebrun should not have been the one to paint this propaganda portrait. There was, in fact, in the highest spheres of government, great concern. Louis XVI's chief minister and advisor, Charles Gravier de Vergennes, was very anxious to put a stop to the bad press vilifying Marie Antoinette. Since unerring male judgment had found Madame Lebrun unfit for the task, the minister had hired a young Swedish artist two years earlier, Adolf Ulrich Weltmüller, who was accredited by the Royal Academy. He had painted a large portrait of Marie Antoinette strolling in front of the Temple of Love at the Trianon, accompanied by two rather stiff little children. The criticism was severe and unequivocal. Is it possible for an artist to know so little about grace and majesty? It has been said that the queen didn't even recognize herself and exclaimed, what, is that me there? The queen should be shown presenting her children to the nation and thus appealing to all eyes and hearts. As a result of this disastrous endeavor, the commissioners agreed to take a look at the portrait of the royal children that Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun had painted the year before. She had done a superb job of rendering the delicate and indefinite nature of their childish features. They decided to engage the Queen's favorite artist, but required her to furnish an exact draft of the composition. Elizabeth had never painted a canvas of that size before. 2.75 meters by 2.15 meters, nor had she ever portrayed so many figures at once. She turned to her friend, the great painter Louis David, for advice. He suggested that she use a triangular structure based on Raphael's painting, The Holy Family. 
David's assistant related their conversation in his memoirs. And there you have your painting, he exclaimed. But my dear David, Madame Lebrun objected, aren't you afraid I'll be accused of plagiarism? No! Nah. Take whatever suits you wherever you can find it. I can assure you that once you've accommodated it all with the fashions of the day, no one will ever suspect you've taken a painting by Raphael as your model. In fact, Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun used several different sources. For the overall layout, the lighting, and the cradle, she was inspired by a work called The Madonna della Gatta by Giulio Romano, who was one of Raphael's students. The Dauphin's isolated position and the movement of his arm recall St. John the Baptist's pose in the Madonna dell'Amponata by Raphael and the Holy Family by his student. Madame Royale's gesture of hanging on to her mother's arm is reminiscent of a work by Correggio, Madonna and Child with Saints Jerome and Mary Magdalene. Although she was inspired by the classics, Elizabeth painted the children according to the modern notions that had begun to develop in the latter part of the century. They were now freed of the fetters of having to dress like miniature adults, which until recently had been the custom. The place of children, the way they were seen, had changed. Twenty years earlier, Jean-Jacques Rousseau had published a treatise on education entitled Émile. In it, the philosopher had clearly outlined the role of the mother. If there is no mother, there is no child. Their duties to one another are reciprocal, and if they are poorly fulfilled by one side, they will be neglected by the other. The commissioners remembered, in particular, another sentence from the book, a mother whose children are not seen is less respected. The artist's tender and benevolent gaze transformed the anticipated image of royalty into an image of maternal bliss, which confused and troubled its viewers as if motherhood was incompatible with majestic grandeur. The critics described the queen in the painting as anxious and distracted, and the other figures as out of this world. The empty cradle and the dauphin's rather forlorn gesture puzzled the exhibition's visitors. There will always be a regrettable sense of ambiguity surrounding that bassinet, which will give it a mysterious air, one critic noted. In fact, there was nothing at all mysterious about it. Sophie Beatrice, the fourth child of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, was born on July 9, 1786, just as Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun started working on the painting. One witness wrote in his memoirs, the painting was made while the young princess was alive. She was shown sleeping in her cradle, while the Dauphin, with a finger to his lips, seemed to be afraid that the baby's sleep would be disturbed. Another witness provides an even more precise description. In the original painting, the models used for the sleeping child and for the Dauphin's gesture of asking for silence were taken from the Madonna with the Blue Diadem by Raphael and a painting by Charles Lebrun, The Sleep of the Infant Jesus. But Sophie Beatrice died just before the salon opened. The artist quickly removed her from the painting and changed the position of the Dauphin's arm. The critics inevitably disapproved of the supposedly negligent movement they perceived in his gesture. Let us take a closer look at the piece of furniture decorated with fleur-de-lis. It is a jewelry cabinet which is set back in the shadows while the children are presented in full light in the foreground. This arrangement is a direct reference to Cornelia, the daughter of Scipio Africanus, who was held by everyone at the time to be the ideal Roman mother. She was devoted to the education of her sons, the Gracchi, and to helping them prepare for their accession to the highest rungs of power. In the presence of a mother who was showing off her finery and her jewels, 
Cornelia prolonged the conversation until her sons came back and then said, these are my jewels. The allusion to jewelry and its conspicuous absence around the queen's very bare neck had a completely different meaning for the salon's visitors. They were reminded of the scandalous affair of the queen's necklace that had erupted the year before. Taking advantage of Marie Antoinette's reputation for shamelessly dilapidating the court's finances with her excessive expenditures, two con artists had acquired a spectacular 3,000 carat diamond necklace by falsifying her name. When the jeweler demanded payment from the queen, the forgery was revealed and she had the case brought to trial before the Parliament of Paris. The swindlers were convicted, but after the verdict, even though Marie Antoinette was not at all involved in the affair, one of the Parliament's judges declared, The Queen implicated in a case of fraud. The crozier and the scepter are bespattered with mire. What a great triumph for the ideas of freedom! The crowds were overjoyed, and the pamphleteers gave free rein to their smear campaigns, railing against the outrageous expenditures. They added the protagonists in this sordid affair to the list of lovers that the Queen supposedly received at the Trianon to satisfy her insatiable libido. All over the French capital, the police were kept busy trying to stamp out these pamphlets which were printed abroad. In vain, however. An anonymous writer described how these malicious rumors were started. A despicable courtier puts them into lines and verses and has them taken to the markets in Léal and Le Marché aux Herbes. From the marketplace, they are carried to the workshop, and the craftsman, in turn, brings them back to the gentleman who created them and who, without wasting any time, run off to whisper in each other's ears in a tone of the most consummate hypocrisy, Have you read them? Here they are. They are all over Paris. The Count of Provence, the king's younger brother, financed pamphlets claiming that Marie Antoinette had many lovers and asserting the illegitimacy of her royal children in the illusory hope of legitimizing his own claims to the throne. The nobles of the court, who had lost the favors of a queen who had snubbed tradition for two decades, took to rumor-mongering with a vengeful delight. The very liberal Duke of Orléans opened the doors of his royal palace, which the police were not allowed to enter, to pamphleteers of all stripes. Initiated by the reactionaries, as well as by the liberals who supported the ideas of the Enlightenment, the defamation campaigns were undermining France's absolute monarchy. They all wanted to limit the power of the king for the benefit of the aristocracy, the bourgeoisie, or even the people. Faced with such a virulent offensive, Madame Lebrun's tenderly painted propaganda portrait could do very little indeed. However, in spite of all the criticism, Requests for copies of the painting were received from all over the country. But the palace no longer believed in it and refused to proceed any further. The costs would certainly be too high. The painting would be displayed in Versailles in the Salon de Mars until the death of the Dauphin in June 1789, a few weeks before the revolution. The propaganda operation had failed. It had come far too late. But Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun's painting remains as a testimony to the monarchy's attempt to win back the love of the nation, to its sudden concern for public opinion, which it came to realize, with a certain naivete, could not be ignored. For rarely are the people wrong. <laughs>